In this section, I'd like to talk to you about visual soil assessments. This may be one of the most powerful things that you can do for above ground performance. I'm not kidding, right? So dig a hole, start to get really familiar with some of these visual indicators. What are they telling you about resilience? What are they telling you about health? Is there some kind of hidden heebie-jeebie that maybe you weren't even aware is starting to build numbers underground? What we often see is that root systems may start to shrink, uh, that we may be losing soil structure over time. So really benchmarking where you are right now and then looking to the future. How do I just keep getting this system better and better? When we're doing our soil textural test, just make sure there's no organic matter that you're including in this. Take soil from about the top four inches. You're gonna take about this much material. We're gonna remove plant roots out of that. You're gonna remove any rock material or dead bugs or anything that might be in here. Just break it up a little bit. And then we're gonna add a small amount of water. Um, if you add too much water, you can add some more soil to that, but you want it nice and squishy. You might have to add a little bit more soil, just if it is too wet. And then um, see if you can roll that in your hands. All right, so we want to make a ball with that soil material. Some of what we can see in this of what is holding a sandy soil together is organic material. So these, you can see how dark the soil is. They've actually improved their soil organic matter. And so we're getting a bit more stick than we would with a soil that uh, is low in organic matter. All right, we're gonna roll that for about two minutes. A sandy soil will often be really challenging to roll, right? You see that, like the soil, the soil is falling apart. Right, so I've made that a little bit wet, so I'm gonna add a bit more soil just to dry it out and then try and get a ball forming out of this. See, I've got a ball and then I can roll that ball just gently. I'm gonna roll that for about two minutes to create some consistency and then we're gonna give it a squeeze. Right, so after we've done this, rolled it into a ball, we're gonna try and make a ribbon. So the more, more um, clay there is in this, then the longer that ribbon will be. So we should be able to form like a ribbon or a worm that might be like three or four inches long if this had a lot of clay. Um, this has got a lot of sand, so it doesn't form a ribbon. Then you're gonna roll it into a ball and you're going to push down on it and see does it crack or fissure. If it cracks or fissures, then it's telling you, see these cracks, that there's more sand in this. If it had more clay, then it actually wouldn't make any cracks or fissures whatsoever. Right, and then feel that in your hands. Does it have a sticky velvety feel to it? Um, it? And that'll tell you more about what's happening with your silt. So silt feels very silky. It feels a little sticky, like it'll stick that soil together between your fingers. But the soil here has just a lot of sand. There's not much stick to it, um, not much clay at all. So we call these a sand loam. <laughs> What we're looking at here is soil structure. How is the soil structured? How deep down do we see that structure developing and what does it even look like? So what you wanna do is take a soil, typically two to four inches wide, six inches deep, as deep as you can go. This soil actually fell apart as we tried to put it into the bowl, but that's how deep this soil sample was. Take that profile that you've got here and break it in half and feel how tight is that to even break it in half what sort of pressure's working against you. And as you break that open, what are you looking down in that profile? What does it look like? Uh, are we seeing air and water movement channels? Do you see that lovely porosity? You see the structure in this soil is actually pretty amazing. So we have got air and water able to move right down through this profile. If you, however, when you break this apart and you see big clods forming and the soil is super tight and there's no air space, you can see that it's compacted and tight, we would score these soils and you could score that soil as a zero. If you have columns, but you have the development of some of these crumbs, then you score that soil, you would score that soil as a one. If, however, it looks like this and you've got these lovely, lovely aggregates and crumbs, then we'd score this soil a two which in my mind is, 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 is pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. 
soil smell. A Californian study with people from any kind of background, didn't matter if you'd grown up on a farm or lived in a city your whole life, people know the smell of healthy soil. So when you dig into this soil, take a handful in that top layer, and sometimes you might need to actually add a little bit of water into this process. And when we add water, it activates the microbiology that make those soil smells. So what we should be smelling is when you're driving on a hot summer's day and you get that bit of rainfall on the road and you get that smell that comes up off the road. Those organisms are called actinomycetes. They're long chain bacteria. You know many of them as streptomycin, for instance, comes from streptomycetes. These organisms are making natural antibiotics and you can smell it. So that soil should smell deep and rich and alive. What you're smelling is called geosmin, which literally translates as the odor of the earth. And we as human beings are tuned in to smell this smell. We can smell this smell at 200,000 times the dilution than what a shark can smell a single drop of water, a single drop of blood rather, in an Olympic swimming pool. So we are tuned in to smell this smell. I personally believe we can smell it because this is where we came from. We came from the soil. So can you smell that? And if it smells deep and rich, I would score this a two. If, however, the soil didn't smell at all, then I'd score it a one. A soil that smells bad, on the other hand, you might recognize some of these smells like when you're digging in a ditch and there's been water that's sitting around or maybe you've walked past a septic station. Like these are the kind of smells that soils start to emit when biology run out of oxygen. We can see in a soil like this that that soil's run out of oxygen. You see how compacted that is. It's turned into a clod. If we break it open, there's, no, there's none of this structure, right? That means we've run out of oxygen. In that state, biology start to make the... Um, sulfurs, the methanes. You can smell this, it'll smell kind of like sulfur or nitrogen or even like farts. This is telling you that this soil has gone anaerobic and when we score this soil we would give this one a zero. To assess the smell of good soil you're going to want to take a handful of soil again in that top four inches um, below that organic layer. Uh, we need to mix that with a little bit of water so you get a spray bottle or you could do this just by pouring some water on and then you're gonna give it a sniff. All right, how does that smell? Can you smell those beautiful earthy tones, the ammonia like a fungal kind of smell? Are these the smells that the soil is now releasing? Assessing soil color can be incredibly insightful in terms of what's been happening historically with management. So how we assess soil color is we will take a sample of soil from within your main playing fields or the area that you're managing. And then I want you to go and find an undisturbed area. So this might be close to trees, it might be under a fence line where there hasn't really been a lot of human interference for a long time. You wanna make sure that you're choosing soils that are from the same soil type. And yeah, just dig a hole, take a look and see what's happening with soil color. Is there a difference? Sometimes when we sample these soils, they might be quite dry. So again, you wanna use a water bottle um, and spray on those surfaces to make sure that we are comparing like for like. So I'm just gonna gently wet this soil surface here. See that color. And then on this soil, we're gonna wet on that surface again to see that color. Is there a noticeable difference between the undisturbed area um, and an area that's may been maybe getting more impact than other areas. And what you'll see is if that soil is the same color, like your playing field is the same darkness as underneath the fence line, that's a really good sign. If it's paler, for instance, if you were to say that this was under your playing fields, then you've actually been losing soil carbon, you've been losing microbiology, um, and I would score this, I would score this a zero if you were significantly different. I'd score it a one if your soil's with the same color. And in fact, if your soil here is darker than under the fence line, which hasn't been disturbed, then you'd score a two. So this is great work. One of the visual indicators that I love is the macroorganisms. So taking a look at earthworms. There's such a diversity of different types of earthworms that are in soil. 
Some of them are the ones that, you know, do put castings up on the surface, but many worms are working horizontally through that soil profile. When we dig a hole, we want to see multiple worms, and this depends, you know, so many of you that are managing um, specially curated sand turf environments may not want to see earthworms at all, but for many of us it's a good indicator that we have got nutrient cycling working, uh, that there are organisms that will be breaking organic materials down. You want to see different types of earthworm species, you want to see the baby worms as well as adult worms through the growing season. They form a critical part of building these super highways and corridors in the metropolis that is below the ground in the soil. How low can you go? Looking at how deep rooting systems are tells you a lot about the health of an ecosystem. Uh, just dig a hole again, take a trusty ruler and assess where is 80% of the root mass in this particular soil. And that tells you a lot about what's happening further down that profile. Uh, in a healthy soil, yeah, we want to see these roots go way below six inches. And that's going to depend a lot on what your management practices are. So if you've been mowing low for a very long time, you might find that these roots have retreated. And you can see in this soil, 80% of those roots are actually going, um, say, four inches deep. Also take a look at, are there more roots further down that profile? Is there anything that might be impeding root movement right down? Now, what could impede root movement might be things like a change in soil texture. There might be a difference in pH. There could be things like aluminum or heavy metals down below that layer. Sometimes if we have a lot of um, insect pests or you have things like nematodes, we may see that root mass only goes about one inch down and you'll see a straight line. Anytime we have a straight line in our rooting systems, you want to get really interested about what's happening because this is affecting above ground growth, health, the quality and the color and the ability of this um, grass sward here to withstand trampling and human activities above ground. So dig a hole, take a look, how deep are those root systems going and the deeper the better. When we're scoring these soils, uh, we're looking at where 80% of that root um, material is. So if it's zero to one inch and it's a sharp line, we're gonna score that soil at a zero. If it goes from one inch to three inches, uh, and that's where 80% of that root mass is, we'll give that a score of one. And if you're below that three inch mark, particularly in mowing situations, then we'd score that a two. If you're in rough areas or areas that haven't been actively maintained, the deeper the better. When we're looking at our visual indicators, there's also indicators that maybe systems aren't working as well as they could. One of these is known as soil mottles. So what happens when you have a water table that may be lifting is that water table comes up and many of our nutrients go into solution. So things like iron and manganese can actually come into solution. Then when that water retreats, they react with that oxygen and they form oxides. So we get manganese oxides and iron oxides. Those iron oxides literally are making rust in that soil. So you'll look and see something that looks like rust build up in the soil, so bright orange colors. The manganese itself will form these mottles that are black in color, so these black squares that you might see through a soil. Also, as the soil becomes more and more waterlogged, we'll start to leach nutrients out and those soils can go a gray color. So looking underneath the ground just to take a look, you know, what is happening with that water table, uh, you'll smell that as well, but are we losing nutrients due to dysfunctional water systems? Um, is something happening with water structure or soil structure? Uh, are we losing all of that material in there because that's when we see these nutrients come into solution? So a really clear, obvious one. So look for those colors. Have we got red, black, or gray? That's telling you that water table's coming up. It'll probably shear your roots off as well. So roots won't necessarily grow down in that zone. Plant health and soil health are intimately interrelated and by having some of these meters we can get an insight into not only what's happening with plant health but also what's happening with soil health. 
So I have a couple of meters here. I have the refractometer. This is the one to measure plant uh, photosynthesis. How well is this plant photosynthesizing? The overall health of that plant. I have a sap pH meter. Um, so we're taking a look at the, the pH that's actually inside the plant sap and then a conductivity meter. What is the conductivity of that plant sap? How much energy is running for these plants to run um, and to grow and be healthy? Taking samples is super simple. I want you to go out in the field and look for perhaps a plant that's least desired. So in this case, that might be something like plantain and then go and sample the plant that you're actually interested in seeing what is the health of the overall turf or grass in this environment. And you don't need like super advanced technology in order to do this. All you need is something like a really simple sap press. Um, you can just buy these at any local store often will have these. You can get more advanced sap presses if you want to. We're going to rip that material up into one inch lengths and put that into that sap press. Um, so I'll take this plantain, I'm going to rip it up. I'm not going to roll it. Um, I'm just going to rip it into sections, put that into the actual um, vial here of the sap press uh, and then squeeze it down. Sometimes what you'll find is some plant material will try and squeeze through the bottom. Uh, then I might just get a penny or something to stop that material squeezing through. So take your refractometer and I'm just going to give it a squeeze and drop a couple of drops of that sap on that lens right there. Um, sometimes plants can be really, really challenging to get sap out. Uh, if it's so hard, it's probably telling you that your plants are dehydrated. Um, and what you want really is just two drops of sap to go onto that lens. You're going to drop that over. You want to make sure that that whole lens is covered with the sap. Um, and then you're going to look through it. Okay. Um, the bricks on your refractometer should be above 12, maybe even higher through that growing season, anything lower than that. And this is where we typically start to see pest, weeds, and diseases. So we can take our sap meter and continue to do our sampling. Take a look at pH in this case. Um, again, we just need a couple of drops of sap. Um, do the same procedure in terms of ripping into one inch lengths. Give it a squeeze. And we want to see two drips that cover the sensor in this case. All right. We're going to turn it on and we're looking for the magic number of 6.4. We find the further away we get from 6.4, this is where you're going to see an increase in pests and diseases. And it doesn't really matter what plants we're growing from trees to vegetables to grasses. We're still looking for a pH of 6.4 that we're around that zone. And the pH in this meter is a little low, showing us that our ions are not being complexed. So there could be an issue with calcium or magnesium or potassium or sodium in this case. So again, another really simple tool. And then the last tool I have here is my conductivity meter. Do I have enough energy to grow a crop? Um, and what we see is this directly relates to, to where I have an excess of energy or conductivity in that soil or in that plant. And when that happens, this is when we'll start to see more nematode pressure. There's a direct correlation with how high this conductivity is and root feeding nematodes. So I'm going to give that a squeeze. Same thing. We want to just cover the vial. And we're looking for anywhere to, um, between 2 to 12 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. If you're below 2, then you haven't got enough energy to grow grass. So you might want to look at something that's going to just help boost the energy that's driving in that system. Um, and if you are above 12, this is ringing the dinner bell for our nematode pests. It's where you'll see a lot of nitrates in that environment. It might be that you've been using soluble nitrogen fertilizers or a lot of fungicides and pesticides will actually push that conductivity up um, and create conditions for poor grass health.